When you own your messes as a leader, you give permission for everyone else to own theirs. And what leader doesn't want their team members to become more self-aware, but you have to model it first. Welcome to the Seismic Shift podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I am super excited about our guest, Scott Miller, who's joining us today. Scott is a true rock star, and he's just super cool. He's on his global speaking tour right now. He's not only a global speaker, he's a multi-selling best or multi, what is it? Multi best-selling author, columnist, podcast host, radio host, and his specialty right now is about mentorship. So his recent book, exactly, is The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship. He also has written about messiness from mess to success. He also wrote about master mentors and 30 essential learnings from the best, best from Seth Godin to Susan Cain to General Stanley McChrystal. I mean, this guy does it all. And on top of that, he has three boys that he's raising with his wife in Salt Lake City, Utah. So for those of you who follow Follow Scott on LinkedIn. It's always just really cool to see somebody like Scott who is traveling the world, promoting his books, delivering the content to help leaders be the very best they can be, and also every night trying to be the best dad and the best husband. And I love that. And I love following your journey. So thank you, Scott Miller, for being on The Seismic Shift. I was grading myself A, B, D. C, D, and F on all those absurd things you were mentioning. Most of them were C minuses, and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. But thank you for your spotlight, and thank you for the platform today, Michelle. Great to be here. You know, I love how you just kind of, you you own it. You know, being a dad is hard. Being a husband's hard. Being a global speaker, keynote speaker is hard. Writing books every six months, which seems to be what you do, which I don't know how you do it, is hard. And I love how humble you are saying, I would give myself a C minus. Um, that, that is one of the things we're exploring today is seismic shifts. You know, I mean, that's the whole goal of the podcast. What seismic shifts are happening out there in leadership? How can we harness? them? How can we understand them so that all of our listeners can be the very best? And so what is a recent seismic shift that you've been seeing? Oh, I think there's a huge swing back to, to power skills. You know, we heard about, we've heard about hard skills and soft skills forever and people needing to know how to code and how to understand AI and the metaverse. And I think we're seeing on this side of the pandemic, and on this side of hybrid work and virtual work, we're seeing a need for good old fashioned interpersonal skills, eye contact, reading body language, offering apologies, knowing how to be a persuasive communicator, knowing how to not just diffuse, but to manage, mediate conflict. I think developing relationships, again, is a seismic shift back to where we came from some time ago. I think I saw where Was it Mark Zuckerberg had just taken about a $40 billion charge or loss on the investment in the metaverse? I'm not sure that means that people don't want to be in the metaverse. I'm not quite sure I even know what the metaverse is. But what I do know is that when I get on a plane and I go meet a client or take the time to go have lunch with someone or on a walk with someone, the relationship is deeper, the trust is better, the business is bigger, the results are superior. So I think there's a seismic shift back to the expertise of being able to develop relationships. Oh my gosh. To all of my listeners, can you see why I love Scott Miller? (laughs) I mean, that is the seismic shift that I wrote about in my first book is it's all about connection now. And that old model that was so transactional, it was so just bottom line, I see you as a number, what numbers do you bring to my company, boop, 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 I'm not going to focus you focus on you as a human, or on the fact that you actually have a life outside of work, and that just doesn't work anymore. It is, I truly believe, it is all about relationships, and, and I term that. It's all about connection. And to me, it's about connection with yourself, connection with your team, connection with the organization. And just like what I said in the very beginning, Scott, how you owned, how I introduced you and you immediately owned it and said, I don't know how well I'm doing that. That is a part of connection, just owning your story and your journey and being real. 
beautifully said. I was at breakfast this morning with uh, a colleague, kind of a, a, a mentor of mine. I'm writing a new book about power skills. We were talking about a variety of things. And, you know, one of the big ideas there was really understanding what are your superpowers? What are you great at? And owning them and being comfortable with them, being comfortable with who you are as a person, but also still, you know, uh, uh, operating and behaving in a way that the culture you're in requires you to without becoming someone else. You know, kind of being amorphous without being a chameleon, with being able to adapt with people's different needs without not knowing who you are. It's a tough time right now. It's a tough time to be yourself and still thrive in a highly politicized world. It's a tough time. And during tough times, we have to go back to what we know best. And that's what you said is the connection with other people is being an expert at relationships. I love how people. you call those yeah. power skills. Can you talk oh, to yeah. us more about this? Oh, sure. It's the, my, my, this new book that I'm writing. I'll be out in 2025. You know, there's, there's hard skills and soft skills. And I think soft skills kind of went through a bad rap for a while. But to your point, soft skills are the new power skills. These are the abilities you have to have to get promoted. Everybody has technical skills. You got the degree, you got the certification, you got the management program outcome. But these power skills are your key differentiator. They really come down to, are you able to develop mutually trustworthy, beneficial relationships? Do you have self-awareness? Do you know what it's like to have lunch with you, to play pickleball with you, to be led by you, to be married to you, to stand in a trade show booth with you? Do you know what it's like to be in a conversation with you? Do you dominate? Do you supplicate? Do you add value? Are you always the first to speak? Are you always the last to speak? Do you never speak? So these are skills that are enormously valuable. Like you, Michelle, I host a couple of podcasts. And one of them is I interview C-suite officers every week. And I always ask them, hey, so I have three sons, 9, 11, and 13. What are the skills you're going to need for them a decade from now to be hired in Nike, Whole Foods, Delta, Wendy's? And they all say the same thing. None of them talk about coding. None of them talk about AI. None of them talk about engineering skills or math skills. Yes, you're going to need some level of specialty, but they all talk about the same thing. These power skills, the ability to get along well with others, to, to leverage differences to come out better off for the company and the shareholders and the stakeholders and the clients. These are power skills that are having a resurgence inside of organizations. Yes, you have to have a credential. You have to know Six Sigma, lean manufacturing. Yes, you have to know social media or project management or engineering, whatever it is you went to school for or studied. You can't get hired and promoted on power skills alone. You've got to have some technical competency in some area. But you'll never thrive in the workplace, become a leader, Lift others along with you if you don't know how to develop relationships. And it's not easy for all of us. I can tell you it's hard for me. If you wanted to hear more about that, I can tell you all, all day long about how I'm kind of an introvert masquerading as an extrovert. I'm a little awkward in social settings. I have a stutter. It's quite debilitating at times. And so I have to work hard to develop relationships. I'm uncomfortable with silence, as evidenced by my extemporaneous 12 minutes of speaking now. And so I have to be super self-aware of what it's like to be in any kind of relationship with me, especially a professional one. It's tough. Oh, I just love how candid and honest you are because somebody like you who's at the top of the top of the top of the top, people would assume, you know, that that everything just came easily or, or you know, you came out of the womb as this unbelievable extrovert who can just connect with everybody. Nobody would ever think that you had a stutter that still to this day is a challenge. And I love that you're putting it out there because one of the chapters in my book, which I think is the most important, is you have to give up perfection. And, and perfection equals disconnection. And I also call that the new leadership power is connection. And again, let's think about that. Perfection equals disconnection. So if you're on this podcast and you just pretend to be perfect, Scott, people are going to end up saying, yeah, 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 but I don't know if I want to go out and have a beer with him, or I know you love champagne, or have a glass of champagne with him. He's not real. 
And, and, and people have a BS factor. And in 2023, people don't seem to like people trying to, to be perfect. People want real humans. And, and I love that you even mentioned pickleball because I actually just came off the pickleball court before this podcast interview. And I'm learning so much uh, watching the social dynamics on the court. And I'm so grateful to my dad, who's 78 years old and still alive and huge sports guy, but he always made sports fun. Every time I go visit him, we go in the basement and play ping pong and we laugh and, and cut up. And he taught me how to be a great team player. So when I'm on the pickleball court, I'm looking at my opposition, right? And I'm like, great serve, great job. Like I'm there like supporting them because to me, pickleball is supposed to be about fun. <laughs> and, 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 and I see so many people who end up just bringing these negative attitudes to the courts. But I'm like, are you not doing this just to have fun? Are you trying to go pro? This is not the place to do it. Let's just be nice to each other. Be good teammates, support one another. So, so much of what you're talking about is soft, which I've been really self-conscious for years and I'm no longer self-conscious. I was the only soft skills professor in the business school at Loyola. And I always was like, I just was like, oh my gosh, I wish I were a finance professor, an economics professor. And now we all realize these skills that I teach, right, leadership and strategic communication at the MBA level are the necessary skills, as you said. No one gets fired because they didn't know how to use Excel or they calculated EBITDA wrong or can't figure out cost of goods. You get fired because you're a jerk, because you offend people. You never offer apologies. You're an arrogant know-it-all. You're the smartest person in the room and you become toxic to the culture. Yes, yes, and yes. I'm on a mission. I want to hear about your mission. I'm on a mission to get rid of jerk bosses. However, I have great empathy for them because I feel like they were mentored, which I'm teeing you up, because they were mentored by people who are like, well, this is just the way it gets done. This is how you, you can't be friends with your people. You've got to be authoritarian. You've got to create this environment that focuses on results. But you're absolutely right, Scott. Inadvertently, those leaders who think that this is how I'm supposed to lead because my mentor taught me that way, they create toxic cultures. So let's talk about mentoring. I want to learn from you. Mentoring has to be a big element of creating a culture of connection, because that's my mission. I want to help leaders create cultures of connection to drive results. What does that look like? What does that sound like? What does that feel like? And I feel like mentorship is a key element. Well, it's why I wrote this recent book, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship. I think when a lot of C-suite executives hear mentorship, they think about some human resource initiative that Okay, I'll approve that line item. Okay, now back to the back to the revenue number, which I get. I was a public officer in a global company for 25 years. 100 quarters of being measured by net revenue and EBITDA. I understand it. I have to tell you, as the new generation, Michelle, comes into the workplace, they're all about meaning and purpose and contribution and connection. They're all about developing relationships and they want to see a career path. They want to understand how are you going to invest in me? What kind of skills am I going to learn? And if you want to build a culture of recruitment and retention, you've got to give people a reason to stay. You have to get, now listen up leaders, you have to recognize that every one of your employees right now today is being recruited on LinkedIn. They're all getting messages. They're all open to opportunities. The average career span is about 18 months right now. I mean, Michelle, I'm older than you, but in my generation, if you stayed somewhere for 18 months, you were toxic, we wouldn't have even interviewed you. Now, if you've been somewhere for 18 years, you, we won't even interview you. You're a dinosaur. So unfortunately now, talent stacking, career stacking is all the commonplace. I say unfortunately because companies want talent to be nurtured internally. And so you've got to shift your thinking to give people a reason to turn off the open to opportunities button on LinkedIn. You've got to build connections with their leaders, with their senior leaders, with the C-suite, which is why I'm so passionate about mentorship and mentor programs, because it is arguably one of the best ways to lengthen the tenure of your 
your up and coming leadership and your younger employees is having them connected to the organization to see a career path. They understand why should I stay here? Are the company's values similar to my values? Is there a chance to go to the Dubai office? Can I go to a trade show? Can I get some learning? Don't underestimate the value that a mentorship opportunity has to make a career lifelong decision. And if they do leave, they might come back. And you want them to go get a bunch of skills and bring them back to the organization. Have them bounce back in. I, as you can see, I'm an unabashed champion of not just mentorship, but of mentorship initiatives inside divisions, departments, platforms, and organizations. Oh, you are preaching to the choir. I love it. And I totally am in alignment with you. And so I'm putting myself in the shoes of some of our lis listeners who are like, yes, yes, and yes. But how do we do it? So please walk us through, how do you do it? And, and, and I'm assuming, like you said, it doesn't have to come from HR. How do you implement a mentor system? Well, let's talk personally, first of all. I don't think you have to know who your mentor is. My, my most influential mentor in life was a guy who led a, a, a talk show on the radio for 15 years in junior high school. I listened to him every night. And he was my biggest mentor, Bruce Williams. He was sort of a small town mayor entrepreneur. And he had an advice show about, you know, how to invest in inheritance, how to buy a home, how to buy a car, what is mortgage insurance, what is term insurance versus life insurance, whole, whole life. And I had a massive education from Bruce Williams. Never met the guy. He died not knowing I was even alive. So LinkedIn has democratized mentoring. Let me remind you, every business titan, every best-selling author, every keynote speaker, every LinkedIn influencer, they're all doing the same thing at 9.45 at night. They're all in bed, tucked in. They're scrolling through their Instagram and their LinkedIn. And they're watching House Hunters International. And so if you want to slide into someone's DMs, whatever that's more professionally, and say, hey, I mean, I'm looking to do something like you did. Would you mentor me for three Fridays for a half an hour? Most of them are going to say, yeah, talk to my assistant, Tom. He'll get you in. You get the point. There has to be some boundaries. So redefine what mentorship means to you. But inside your organization, if you're a mentee looking for a mentor or you're a leader looking to give back, you can start your own mentorship initiative, right? Start matching people, set some boundaries, say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to do Friday sessions once a week for 45 minutes. Mentee, here's the five things you need to do. Don't ask them for a loan. Don't ask them to be your champion. Don't ask them to be your ally. A mentor is not an ally. Not the same. Come prepared, make and keep commitments, show up on time, have an agenda, have a goal. Mentors. Show up on time, have a goal. Don't live vicariously through your mentee like parents live through their children, right? Your job is not to right the sins of your childhood through your mentee. Don't ever say, well, if I were you, because you're not them, say, well, here's what I did when I was faced with similar circumstances. Let's see if any of my wisdom, mistakes, and successes have any relation to you. Be aware of how intimidating it can be to be mentored by you with your title and your, your body language and your vocabulary. Just be super self-aware. Keep your boundaries clear. It's a very important role in mentorship is to set boundaries. And then once your mentee honors them and proves themselves worthy of you lowering those boundaries, then you can do that. Whole chapter on the power of setting boundaries. Just take the initiative. I, I am passionate about a lot of things, but I'm also mindful that great leaders don't always make great mentors. The competencies that may have made you a great, men, a great leader may or may not translate into great mentorship. It's why I wrote the book, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, 13 Roles to Making a True Impact, because sometimes you underplay these roles. Sometimes you overplay them. Sometimes you shouldn't play them. Depending upon the circumstance with your mentee, you might play one or two of them. But my gift to the mentors on this call is to have a working knowledge of them. And by the way, to the mentees looking for a mentor, although the book is meant for mentors, if you were to read the book, it would absolutely help you be a better mentee and also select a better mentor for your needs. Oh my gosh, I love it. And so I can't stop thinking about what, when did you write the book on 
the 30 essential learnings from Susan Cain and General Staniel. That's the series called Master Mentors by the same publisher, HarperCollins. Every year I write a new volume. Volume, Like you, I host this podcast and I'm able to interview influential people. And every year I pick 30 of them and I write an insight about a transformational idea they had. So that came out the last two years and a new one coming out this year. And with that book series, Master Mentors, somehow I got a reputation as knowing something about mentorship. And that's why I wrote this book. What was your favorite big aha moment from Seth Godin? Oh, this idea of your smallest viable market. I think too many entrepreneurs and leaders are trained in business school to think about your largest viable market, also sometimes known as the total addressable market. Seth Godin, the famous you know leadership and marketing podcaster, blogger, icon, author, he talks about your smallest viable market. Who's your first customer? Who's your first reader? Who's your first subscriber? What is their name? What is their demographic? What is their circumstance? What is their pain? What is their language? And solve that. Okay, your first customer. Now, who's your second? Okay, solve that. And I think the more niche you get, the more successful you are. I've had this privilege of interviewing 350 of the biggest business titans in the world. What they all have in common is they're known for something particular. Susan Cain, introversion. Kim Scott, radical candor. Liz Wiseman, multipliers. Tiffany Alice, the budget nista, right? Urban financial planning for black um, entrepreneurs and people. I, I mean, I, I, Dr. Daniel Amen, right? Brain health. I can go on and on and on. Bobby Herrera, he's known about the gift of struggle. The most impactful people have a flywheel around one particular thing. It's probably why my brand is so confusing to people. I write about marketing, I write about leadership, I write about careers, I write about mentorship. Well, I had the privilege of being in a corporation for 30 years and learned a lot, and I'm willing to suffer that diminishment of my brand to the extent there is some confusion. But from Seth Godin, it's the smallest viable market. What is your flywheel around and stay focused on that? Somewhat counterintuitive to how I've approached my own business. What about Susan Cain? You had mentioned earlier that you really are an, yeah. more of an introvert. And so yeah. these you, you're on a world tour right now and you don't stop. And, and how, what did you learn from her about introversion? Well, so obviously I, I say I'm an introvert masquerading as an extrovert. I don't know if I'm either, you know, I, I'm a little bit confusing that way, confused even about that. But what I learned is she wrote a book called Quiet. This is a seminal book, Susan Cain. And all leaders, all mentors should read this book because it really talks to people like me that appear as an extrovert, very charismatic and loud and dominating. And oftentimes I find more quiet, retiring and shy people difficult. I think they lack enthusiasm or passion or contribution. No, they're just not expressing, like I do, every thought that came to their mind. They're more thoughtful. They're more deliberate. They have more disciplined, rigorous thinking. They don't like me. I'm an external processor. I have to hear myself say it out loud to decide whether or not I believe it. It's why some politicians are quite dangerous. They test their policy speeches by applause in the audience and don't really have a political ideology. You can figure out that one. Susan Cain's book is really written for introverts and how to thrive in a world that listens to and rewards extroverts. So my brother is a raging introvert, chemical engineer, black belt Six Sigma, MBA in business process from MIT, left brainer, could not work a cocktail party to save his life. And there's me who can't, you know, I can't even spell Six Sigma, let alone know what it even is. <laughs> but for leaders like me that actually can minimize and disregard introverts, it gave me a, such an awareness around, no, just because the person isn't speaking up in the meeting doesn't mean they're not perhaps even paying closer attention to the person who's a gadfly, who's repeating everything I say. And I had so many instances where 
as a leader, I might have, you know, a team meeting, fly in 25 salespeople, and of course, all the extroverts who are the sycophants sit up front and feed my ego, whereas the introverts take serious notes, and then they call me three days later. And they say, you know, on Tuesday around noon, Scott, you talked about this, and I'm like, Tuesday at noon? What are you talking about? And they had copious notes, and they thought about it. It just took them a day or two to gather their thoughts and to ask their question in a really thoughtful way. And it was through Susan Cain's book that as a extroverted leader, I became much more appreciative of the value in and not to dismiss the perceived lack of value by people who were different than me, the quieter people. Oh, that is just a beautifully articulated way of describing it. Um, I just interviewed Sally Helgeson on her book, Rising Together, on a culture of inclusion and belonging. And again, many similarities with my work on a culture of connection, which many similarities with Morag Barrett's work on allyship, right? So you, you are, like you said, you're not just one word. You're not just mentorship. You also are um, the podcast host who interviews all the chief executives. You also have the whole series on messiness. I mean, you do, and marketing. You do represent a lot of different areas. So let me ask you this, Scott. If you were giving advice to our listeners right now, my leaders, who want to create a culture of connection based on true relationships and those soft skills, which are the power skills, what would you recommend? How do you create a culture of connection to drive results? You know, I heard this adage once that I think is, is piercingly insightful. Many of us walking around saying we have 30 years of experience when in fact it's usually one year of experience repeated 29 times. We find a style that works for us and we just hammer it home. And I think for many decades it was successful. You had a leadership style and most of your people were hostage to it. You had the authority, the positional power. You may or may not have had any principle-centered power, but you had coercive power, you had utility power, you had positional power, and therefore everyone had to kind of cleave to and align with your leadership style. Those days are over. It's never going back. So leaders, listen up. As you're clinging to your leadership position for the rest of your career and you want to leave a legacy, you want your reputation to be one of connection, of building a healthy culture where people thrived under you. Yes, through high courage conversations, probably yes, through terminations, yes, through promotions, yes, moving outside of your comfort zone and giving people feedback on their blind spots, right? Changing your leadership style doesn't mean you change your standard. It doesn't mean you change your values, but it may mean that you change the way you develop relationships. And so now what I tell people that are my age, that are like me, that are still very relevant in the workplace is you've got to recognize that you need to employ what I would call an individualized style of leadership because Tina and Tom and Nancy and Kim all need a different style of leadership. They like to be rewarded differently. They like to be recognized differently. They like feedback differently. They like to be challenged differently. And so as exhausting as it is, you need to understand what are each of the individualized needs your team members have, and you've got to accommodate them because everyone has different needs. People don't quit their, their, their jobs. They quit bad bosses and corrupt cultures. And if you want people to stick around, they've got to feel a connection with their leader. People don't go across the street for 1% more commission, 10 more thousand dollars a year, or beer on tap on Fridays anymore. They did back, you know, in the, in the massive exodus. People ask me all the time, Michelle, Scott, why did you stay at Franklin Covey for 25 years? That's insane. Well, I could have earned a lot more money at the hedge fund. I could have had a lot more money doing something else. You know why I didn't quit? The Mm. CEO loved me. My leader loved me. He loved my wife. He loved my kids. He loved me. We fought like father and son. We have nothing in common. He's very cautious and deliberate and thoughtful and reserved. And I'm like, 
say what's on my mind. I'm a bull in a china shop. I'm super creative. I have unbridled energy. We have nothing in common. But he loved me and I loved him back. And we fought a lot. There were times he had to leave the room to gather his his emotions, probably not, not to like kick me out. But I didn't quit him because he loved me. And I said, yeah, I said no to a lot of offers. And so if you want to build a culture of connection, you've got to ask yourself, have I been doing the same thing for 29 years over and over and over again? Is it time for me to move outside of my comfort zone and get to know my people, to really get to know what it is they're passionate about, what are their fears, what are their goals, what are their true geniuses? Is this even the right place for them to be working? Do I have the courage to say, Michelle, you're super talented. Can I tell you? I think your talents are misplaced here. I don't think this company can actually give you what you need. And you're going to hear that as I'm telling you, you need to leave and you're right because I care about you too much to have you feel diminished and tolerated. And so the gift I'm giving you is I think we should work on a plan for you to go find an organization that truly values your talents because there will be tons of them. I don't think your talents fit with this culture and you're going to be super frustrated and so are your leaders. Let's go find you the right place to like live your voice and deploy your genius. That's a huge gift to someone versus trying to force them into the right fit, trying to manage them, which will end up being minimizing to them and often ends up in like litigious litigation because they don't work for a leader that knows how to unleash their creativity in the company or have the bold conversation to say, you know, I just wonder, would you be better somewhere else? My intent isn't to railroad you out of here, but I just don't know this is the right fit for you. Let's talk about it. I love what you just said. And, I, and my new phrase is radical humanity. And that's what I'm trying to coach as an executive coach. I have so many leaders. I mean, I feel like you're, you're talking exactly about many of the leaders that I'm coaching who have recognized that some of their chiefs on their team are not the right people and they care about them so much. They want to find them a better place. And it really is about radical humanity. I think, I think connection right now is radical humanity because you're right. It can be exhausting. I've had people listen to my audiobook, friends of mine who've come up to me at parties here in New Orleans say, you're telling me that I have to get to know each and every one of my leaders and their desires and interests and what they want to do for the rest of life and their superpowers. And I said, yes. And it is tiring and it does take up energy, but that is exactly what is expected. And that's the seismic shift that I'm seeing. It, it's radical humanity. It's also, Michelle, it's why not everyone should be a leader of people. Not everyone should be a commercial airline pilot. Not everyone should be an anesthesiologist. And not everyone listening to your podcast should be a leader of people. But if you choose to be a leader of people, then it is incumbent upon you to move outside of your comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables and just in practice radical humanity. Kim Scott, right? The famous author of the book, Radical Candor. What she says is the opposite of radical candor is ruinous empathy. Think about that. Too many leaders practice ruinous empathy. Quite frankly, they're not mature enough to balance high courage with high diplomacy, declare their intent in a high courage conversation. My intent's not to minimize you. My intent's not to embarrass you. My intent isn't to railroad you out of here, but we need to have a high courage conversation to make sure that your skills are deployed against our key results and to make sure we're always aware when you or we are off on that to make sure that we create a culture where those whose skills do allocate to our top priorities can thrive and to where those who don't can thrive elsewhere. Because everyone needs to work, but not everyone needs to work here. I feel like you just identified some crucial elements in, in, in what a culture of connection would look like. So we think mentorship for sure, right? And it's also those courageous, tough conversations. And one of the things you recommended was having those meetings, those one-on-ones with your people and really diving in with what are your superpowers? Where do you want to, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you think this is the right place for you? How can I best develop you? And a lot of leaders, I feel like, are scared to have those honest 
deeper conversations, but that's what we're calling on, right, Scott? So what's one piece of advice that you could leave with our listeners that they could do today, tomorrow to be more powerful in their communication, their connection, their relationship, their mentorship? Own it. If if developing relationships philosophically makes sense to you, but pragmatically is not easy for you, talk about it. Sit your team down and demonstrate the courage and say, you know, I don't think anybody here disputes my ability to develop systems and to read a P&L and to hold people accountable for their sales pipeline. I don't think many people dispute my skill on that. I think we all would agree that I actually could probably be a little more gentle, a little more kind, maybe a little more forgiving, maybe um, a little less. You get the point. And so I'm trying to be better at developing relationships. It's probably going to feel awkward. It might even sometimes feel contrived. I need you to pre-forgive me because I want to be a better leader. And I recognize that my ability to connect with you is crucial to you liking coming to work, to you giving your all. Because as a leader, I can't force engagement. What I can only do is create the conditions where you choose a high level of engagement. And so I'm going to try my best to get to know each of you better. Let's laugh about it. You can tease me. It's okay. I'm going to be on a journey like you. Can I tell you people want to work for that person? People want to work for the guy or the gal that says, I'm kind of awkward. I know it's hard to get to know me. I'm sure it's something my parents did to screw me up later in life. Some day over lunch, we'll talk about that when I, my therapist lets me. People want to work for that leader. They don't want to work for the, the distant stuff shirt. They want to work for the guy or the gal that can laugh at their own mistakes without opening the kimono or confessing all your sins in the workplace. That's not appropriate. So the first thing to do is to just be comfortable on what you're good at and what you're not at and set the example, because when you own your messes as a leader, you give permission for everyone else to own theirs. And what leader doesn't want their team members to become more self-aware, but you have to model it first. I spent 25 years tutoring under Dr. Stephen R. Covey. One of his most famous phrases was, be a light, not a judge. Be a model, not a critic. Wow. Oh my gosh. Mic drop. My goodness. Scott Miller, I could not have said that any better. You were just an amazing guest. I loved all of your examples, your insights, your advice, all of the expertise and the wisdom that you brought to this. You really helped every single person who's going to tune in to the Seismic Shift podcast be a better version of themselves, own their stories, focus on relationships and connection because that's the seismic shift. Thank you so much, Scott. My pleasure. I am irritated with you because your podcast has caught my attention and I now had to, add, have had to add it to my subscribe list and I didn't have the time. So now I am not listening to other podcasts because I've been listening to your podcast because your books have been profound. So <laughs> thank you for having such a powerful interviewing skill. Oh, <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm, a, I'm fan. a huge fan of yours. Thank you all to the listeners and have a beautiful day. Take care. Bye now. Thank you for joining us on The Seismic Shift. And before you go, can I ask one favor of you? Do you mind sharing today's episode with a leader you know? The power of this conversation is found in your using it and sharing it to create real connection in your life. Lastly, I'd like to thank Loyola University, New Orleans, and the Terra Firma audio team for helping bring this content to life.